Welcome to Shattering Myths, especially on this day, which is Passover. It's a program devoted to the most important and to the fastest growing segment of society. To those who know that the world's political, religious, military, and economic institutions are corrupt, that they are counterproductive, that they cannot be fixed. Our mission, therefore, is to know who is working against our interests, to understand how and why they are doing so. Because exposing and condemning such schemes, even if they are religious or political, isn't hateful, it's caring. In our concluding hour, we're going to use evidence and reason to explore the Torah, which means teaching, not law, particularly on this day, Passover, and tomorrow and the following day, the celebration of Matzah and Bakurim, because its liberating and empowering covenant provides the only reliable answer for you and your family. Our phone number, if you'd like to participate in this discussion, is 877-376-45. We're going to begin with about 30 minutes of news and then going to transition into what God has to say about this day, which is Passover. Uh, the news is, starts off religious. Uh, Reuters is reporting that a tired and somber-looking Pope Francis as to why they would speak of him being tired and somber-looking is uh, a mystery to me. But nonetheless, the journalist at Reuters thought that you ought to know that he was tired and somber. He led a Palm Sunday service before more than 100,000 adoring fans. Opening uh, the adoring fans was my editorial comment. Opening uh, two packed weeks of activities, including Easter and the canonization of two popes. Well, the Torah says that four days before Passover is when the Passover lamb enters the home. Yosha walked into Jerusalem four days before Passover. Passover is today. So, I guess if you were to spot this Pope three days, a branch versus a palm, and a sun god or two, he would have been right instead of wrong. There is nothing on earth, I mean nothing on earth, that God despises more than corrupting his testimony about the meetings that he has established between us and him. Passover is the first of these meetings. He has seven of them. And there is nothing more important to God than us coming to understand what these days represent, and participating in them by acknowledging his invitation. When a religious leader corrupts this by speaking of Palm Sunday, which is religious rubbish, and of Easter Sunday, which is an absolute and utter abomination to God, and doesn't acknowledge Passover, matzah, and firstfruits, firstborn children, trying to conceal what God conveyed while promoting what man has conceived, he becomes the single most despicable individual on the planet. If you're looking for repulsive, you'll find him. He may be tired and somber looking, but from God's point of view, he is an abomination, repulsive and disgusting. And if you side with him, you're going to appear similarly. Hello, Larry. Well, I understand that you're uh, taking today off in, uh, in observance of the Torah's instructions, which is a wise thing to, uh, to do. Um, what's your opinion of uh, Pope Francis? Well, I, I think that uh, he's one of those... Few people that that won't won't die when he's his physical body ceases to exist. That's correct. I think he'll be uh, tormented forever in Sheol. Yeah, and that is uh, true. that's what I think of him. And uh, you know, obviously, I'm I'm just looking at Yahweh's words, and they're not my opinions. What he yeah. says, and yeah, they're they're in a lot of trouble. Have you have you ever noticed anything that Yahweh has said that contradicted something else he has said? No. Have you ever found any place where Yahweh told us something happened when we have later found out that it did not happen that way? No. 
you ever found any instance when Yahweh said, this is what is going to happen, and it failed to happen? No. So you would say that uh, the God, Yahweh, who authored the Torah, has a pretty good track record for being consistent and for being right. Oh, I would say he was 100% of both. You know. So when Yahweh says there's absolutely no forgiveness for someone who uh, uh, promotes lifelessness in his name as is this Pope, um, you would then conclude that that statement is reliable. Absolutely. So we really don't have to speculate as to whether or not, even though it's not our job to determine who ceases to exist upon the uh, their earthly demise, who gets to live forever with Yahweh, and who uh, gets to spend an eternity uh, tormented by fellow demons and uh, in Sheol, based upon Yahweh's testimony, um, this uh, this boy is in uh, in more trouble than just being a little tired and somber looking. I would say so. You know, anybody you know he calls a sure an abomination. Um, yeah. One of the things that they had to do uh, when they took part in uh, uh, Pesach, when they got finished uh, way back uh, during the days of King Hezekiah, they went out and they, they tore down all the Ashura vestiges that would be Easter vestiges. Right. right. Yeah, Ashura is uh, directly associated with Easter. There is, it's, it's three quarters of Ashura is just pure Easter. It's the basis for uh, Easter. It uh, even used one of uh, Ashura's names, Esther, uh, in the celebration of, uh, of Easter, making uh, God's statement against uh, uh, this religious sun goddess myth uh, an abomination to him. But beyond that, uh, she is uh, the basis of the mother of God and the queen of heaven, which is an essential part of Roman Catholicism and of Orthodox Christianity. And that's the other quarter of a Shira. Yeah, well, you know, and, and you know, that's, uh, they used to, in the uh, uh, Lord's Covenant, you know, they'd go out there and they'd worship that that bull with the sun between its horns. And yeah. as you know, each year that Easter happens, the sun is in constellation with Taurus the bull. What, what, did, God, what did God do during the, uh, the time of the Exodus uh, when... Uh, Moshe was uh, was up meeting with him, getting uh, uh, dictation really of the of the Torah directly from Yahweh, and he uh, returns to find uh, a number of a significant number of the Israelites that have just been saved from the religious and political realm of Egypt. He finds them uh, worshiping the sun god in the form of uh, of the golden calf with the sun disc between its uh, its horns. What did he do to them? He was none too happy. He annihilated them, didn't he? Yeah, uh, he, uh, he, annihil he annihilated them. They just said, you can look at Yasha Yehu, and it says right here in uh, 17.8, and this is from the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, so it's extant. So then they shall not regard or accept altars of gods that are the work of the hands, nor what their fingers have made. They will not look or uh, delight in Ashura and sun images and idols. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is all Ishtar or Easter is about. And I, I just Correct. can't imagine people think they're pleasing the creator of the universe. Well, he made himself pretty clear. The opposite of what he said. Yeah, he's pretty, made himself pretty clear. If you're the perpetrator of such lies, uh, then uh, you're going to spend your eternity separated from God, which means you're going to spend it in Sheol. Uh, and if you are the victim of such lies, as were the case of most of those Israelites who were chose to worship the sun god, you're going to die. Now, we all die, but some of us, uh, upon our mortal death, um, are immediately transformed into children of Yahweh and get to spend eternity with him. Um, recreated, if you will, uh, spiritually in, uh, in his image. Uh, and beings of energy. Of right, life. yeah. yeah. And many are going to be uh, uh, awakened. Um, and in the story that uh, Yashaya tells of, uh, of America, he says that you know, you're going to be awakened abruptly. And, and those who were belligerent, those who were in opposition to him, 
that they're going to be tormented forever um, by the inmates of Sheol, which are Satan and his demons. And then the vast majority of people, the victims, will simply cease to exist. Their souls will be annihilated um, upon their demise. There will be no punishment, no heaven, nor hell for uh, for them, and that's what uh, happened with the sun god worshiper. So if you are a sun god worshiper, if you go to church on Sunday, if you uh, uh, celebrate Easter Sunday, um, you need to know that if you are simply victimized by the religion, you go and you uh, uh, and you honor the sun in this way, that upon your death, your soul will cease to exist. And well, that's not good. It's certainly squandering the opportunity of the covenant. It's not bad either. Bad is what happens if you're a pope, if you're a pastor. If you're up there before the people and and inviting them to attend Easter sunrise services, you're inviting them to embrace the Asherah, the sun god imagery. If you're up there and, uh, or you call a radio program and you're promoting Easter Sunday in Christianity, then the, the, your faith is entirely different. And you're going to, you're not going to cease to exist upon your device. You're going to spend eternity in Sheol. That's what God said. There has to be a consequence for leading people astray. And that is where we are. So here, returning just a moment to Roman Catholicism and the uh, and the Vatican, uh, the uh, the faithful waved uh, palm fronds and olive branches. The olive branches are at least accurate. Wrong day, wrong purpose. But the palm fronds, wholly inaccurate. The reason that it's called Palm Sunday and the waving of the palm fronds is because that is a uh, direct derivative of the Babylonian religion. The Babylonian religion to celebrate Ashura Day. Um, waved palm fronds. Yahweh had no such instruction, and there was no such instruction in uh, Jerusalem on this day. The uh, uh, square, uh, to celebrate this, rather than talking about Yosha's, a name that they'd never use, arrival in Jerusalem in accordance with the Torah four days before Passover, the Pope got into his white Jeep Popemobile, and he rode through the Vatican. Welcome back to Shattering This. This uh, report from Reuters concludes with the following statement. Palm Sunday marks the day that the Bible says Jesus rode into Jerusalem to the cheers of crowd before the uh, Christians believe that he rose from the dead. That's not what the uh, uh, even the Christian New Testament says. Right? Beyond the fact that there is no one named Jesus, and you won't find the name Jesus even in the uh, Greek accounts of the Christian beginnings. Bible is the name of a pagan sun goddess. Beyond those two errors, what the both the Hebrew testimony and the Torah and the prophets present is that Yosha came into Jerusalem four days before Passover. Now, one of the most powerful prophecies in the whole of the Torah is found in Daniel 9. Daniel means God judges and vindicates. In the ninth chapter, you'll uh, read a prophecy of where uh, Daniel was told uh, the exact number of days between the, uh, the time of the edict for them to, uh, for Yehudim, to be freed from slavery in Babylon to the time that the Messiah, Yahusha, would arrive in Jerusalem. And that day happens to be in 33 CE. It was a Monday because in 33 CE, Passover was a Friday, which means it began Thursday evening. Is Monday Sunday? No. No. Yahweh tells us 
that he wants the Passover lamb to come into the home four days before Passover because he wants the family to become acquainted with it, to observe it, to care for it. Exactly what Yahushua did. <laughs> Son of a gun, yeah, we're still consistent. Yeah, well, everything he says is what uh, we find materialized. So this, this um, idea that uh, it's Palm Sunday uh, is, uh, is a lie on two accounts. Number one, it didn't occur on a Sunday in 33 CE. Also, uh, what day is today, uh, Larry? Day of the week. What do we call it? Uh, today's Monday. Yeah, okay. Um, which means that, uh, and Passover in 33 CE was on a Friday, right? That's right. So, does the, can you establish a day of the week to celebrate uh, any one of the events surrounding uh, Passover? Can well, you say I, it's always on a always on a Sunday? It's always on a Monday? Always on no, a no, on a Tuesday? No, that, no, that would no. change. That would change. Yeah. yeah. It could be. So just the whole idea of establishing their celebrations on a Sunday shows their their love of the day that venerated their Lord, the Sun God. Right. For example, because it certainly has nothing to do with Yahusha or or Yahweh's plan. Correct. So. I, Pesach can be celebrated any one of the seven days of the week. It's, uh, it's not determined based upon a weekly schedule. It's determined based upon a, uh, a, a lunar solar calendar. Now, I had a very specific plan, and he told us what the first month of the year was going to be. He told us how to, to know when the first day of the first month of the year was, uh, was occurring. And he told us on the 14th day of that uh, first month, which was called Abib, that it would be the celebration of Passover. And since a month can start on any day of the week, the 14th day of a month can be any one of the seven days of the week. To, to establish it as a Sunday just shows the extraordinary um, affinity that Christianity has for all things sun-related, which you read a passage there a moment ago that said, you know, uh, says that those who honor the sun in this way are excluded from heaven. So it's pretty clear that this is a really stupid idea. Uh, scripture does not say Yahweh did not say, even the Christian New Testament doesn't say, that a fellow named Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a Sunday to create Palm Sunday. It says nothing of the sort. As for uh, bodily resurrection, which is what uh, Christians claim they'll be celebrating, the, even the Greek testimony says that God didn't die and that there was no bodily resurrection. The very basis of the religion is an utter and complete lie. When we return to Shattering Mist, we will um, consider what God had to say. Because as Larry said, he has a consistent track record. He's always telling the truth. <laughs> Before I begin to summarize Yahweh's plan, and then we go into great detail as to how he communicated it to us, I want to make certain that everyone listening knows what options are available to them. God created us with free will. He gave us a mortal life which has a, uh, a, a time limit to it. He gave us a... And the Salma, which is this uh, conscience, the seat of good judgment, the place that we can exercise good judgment, where we can differentiate between that which is true and that which is false, that which is reliable and that which is not. And so, under the auspices of free will, another one of his gifts, we have the opportunity to decide, so long as we are still rational, something that political correctness wants to eliminate. But so long as we are rational, 
we have the opportunity to evaluate the evidence and determine whether or not religious institutions promoting the Babylonian festival of Ishtar, Easter, on Sundays are telling the truth or whether Yahweh is dependable. Your choice. Now, on this program, I'm going to tell you God's view of the religious alternative, which he despises. And I'm going to share with you what he has to say about his plan, his way, which is the only path to him. Now, you don't have to walk along it. You can choose the religious alternative. You can even promote the religious alternative. Or you can choose what Yahweh has to offer. The choice is yours. But understand, there's a consequence associated with each of the three options. So as we consider this, you need to know that if you choose to promote Easter and Sundays and Christianity, then the consequence for doing so is that you are going to be eternally estranged from Yahweh, which means that you have been found guilty, you will be found guilty, you are committing a crime which has a punishment associated with it. This Pope is engaged in that. So many Christian evangelicals are engaged in it. Every religious advocate is engaged in it. The consequence is eternal separation from God. That place is known as Sheol. You'll find Paul there, which many Christians will find comforting until they realize that he was lying to them. The second option, you can simply be a victim. You can squander your life. Not recommended, but that option is available to you. You can just go along and say, you know, I can't believe that so many people can be wrong about this, even though God told you that most people would be wrong. If you choose to be misled, if that is your choice, the consequence is that you will have squandered the gifts that God gave you. Well, and you know, it, it also, uh, <clears throat> if, if, if I can just speak here, sure. yeah. it, uh, it, for people to think that the majority are correct makes Yahushua a liar when he says mm -hmm. that few find this narrow path. So, yeah. I mean, how do you square that with, well, a billion people agree with me and you're, you're on your own? Uh, perhaps they could have asked Noah that, or a lot. Yes. Because Wait, that's where you better be. You know, Christianity is the minority here. has yeah. been the world's most popular religion since Constantine um, uh, authorized it. It has been the world's largest religion since that period of time. And so you're dealing with the most popular path, which Yahweh says is leads to death and destruction of one soul, so, uh, versus uh, his path, which is narrow, which he says very few find. Just in Yahushua's opening statements, in the Sermon on the Mount, the religion of Christianity, as is the religion of Islam, any religion that's popular, Hinduism, socialist, secular humanism, they're destroyed. But particularly Christianity, because it claims that its religion is based upon the words and deeds of this man whose opening statements in the Sermon on the Mount destroyed their credibility. We also have uh, Glenn, who's called in from uh, Philadelphia. Happy uh, Pesach, Glenn. Uh, yes. Um, okay, well, interesting was that I guess first I would make the point um, about the dating of Easter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to run this one by Easter is uh, the first Sunday after the, the first ecclesiastical full moon after the vernal equinox. You can't get much more astrological than that. Um, it is true. It is true. It is true. Uh, but by the way, yeah, I was, I was testimony is he, he tells you that the first month, is uh, is based upon the time that barley, which is the standing grain, uh, rises and the and the kernel begins to form, is still green and growing and receptive, and so he's using this the the symbolism of grain and of bread and of uh, uh, which he uses throughout his testimony, and he says that's the first month of the year, and then he uh, he talks about renewal. And it's a renewal of light, kadash, is the uh, the term. And he associates renewal of light with renewal of our souls. And it's the uh, the 14th day after such renewal when uh, barley is growing in receptive, standing grains. Yeah, so it's uh, God's testimony and the uh, um, 
and the establishment of Easter. And by the way, you know, there's a there's a rule within um, the the Christian establishment of Easter that Easter can never fall on Passover. It, they they change the date if it were to fall on Passover. And you know what's what's unbelievably really stupid about that? Easter and Passover aren't days that are that are in conflict. They're they're irrelevant to one another. Right, right. Uh, it's it is Bukhodom that uh, Easter provides a pagan alternative for. <laughs> they don't even know what Bukhodom is, so uh, it's, uh, you're right. Uh, you couldn't be more pagan. Right, right, right. Um, the reason I actually called was um, a good time to, to get the clarification mm-hmm. about um, you, you often say that God cannot die. Yes, mm-hmm. um, okay, and yes, mm-hmm. so Christians are here hearing you talk mm-hmm. about, like, say, the Shroud of Turin, the mm-hmm. trans, you know, the, 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 the transmutation of the mm-hmm. body, that sort of thing. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of Christians think in terms of first death and second death, and there was the idea that the that uh, when, when the physical body stops breathing and the heart stops beating mm-hmm. and the body's buried, that's the first death, and then to go to Sheol would be the second death. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, you say more categor- categorically that, um, you know, God cannot die. So, right. in other words, a lot of people probably perplexed as to exactly what you're saying became of the walking, talking, right. physical body of you know, so, there's a, sure. you know, sure. so there's a semantic distinction that needs pretty careful clarification. Well, I would agree. Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do it. Uh, Yosha, as a, uh, his physical body represented the Passover lamb. And as a representing the Passover lamb, his physical body was, uh, was sacrificed. His soul, however, continued to exist, and the part of him that was actually Yahweh, that was actually God, left him before his physical body died. Because Yahweh's spirit, who is spirit, cannot be associated with death. And so the comment that Yosha makes on the upright pole, which is a comment that Christians cannot reconcile, it is, it is absolutely and wholly destructive to the religion. Yosha says, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? To forsake is to leave. Why have you separated yourself from me? And at that moment, the physical body that was on the upright pole and the soul that occupied that body were estranged from God. And so even if you just look at the testimony of the eyewitnesses in the so-called Christian New Testament, it affirms what I'm saying, that God cannot die. God did not die. The spirit of Yahweh left the physical body and the soul that was hanging on the upright pole. Now, it goes way beyond that, however. When Yosha stated my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was directing our attention to the most comprehensive, the most detailed, the most accurate eyewitness account of what was happening and would happen. He was reciting the opening lines of the 22nd Mizmor, or Psalm. It begins exactly the same way. And in that Mizmor, in that psalm, Dode, who was inspired to write it, gives us an eyewitness account of exactly what was happening and would happen on this day, on which was Passover, on the next day, which was Matzah, unyeasted bread, and on the following day, which was Bukhodom. And he gives us an eyewitness account all the way through, explaining precisely what was happening. So on the first point... Yosha himself acknowledges, the psalm confirms, and even the eyewitness accounts um, collaborate, cooperate the idea that God did not die. There was a physical body and a soul there, and the spirit of Yahweh departed. God cannot die. He is immortal. He did not die. All right, now we have a body and a soul on the upright pole. You mentioned, uh, Glenn, and you are correct, that most people determine uh, death to be when there is no more breath. The Hebrew word for soul 
Nefesh is also the Hebrew word for breath. Yosha's physical body served as the Passover lamb. The physical body died. His soul, however, did not die. And usually it's the departure of the soul, the departure of breath, that determines whether or not a person is alive or dead. The soul is our consciousness. The soul is our ability to be aware of our surroundings and to respond to our surroundings. Uh, all animals have souls, which is why animals, unlike plants, can observe and respond to their surroundings. According to the 22nd Psalm, his soul had a mission, and his soul commenced that mission on uh, the evening of uh, Passover. Now, before we talk about the mission that his soul commenced on the evening of Passover, which is why, but well, I don't want to tell you, it's a great question, and I'm glad that you asked for clarification for here, because this is the, is the lie that Christians have been told to believe a pagan Babylonian religion. His physical body was then placed in a limestone tomb. God tells us in great detail that the remains of the Passover lamb shall not exist until morning and that it is ex expressly to be consumed in the fire. Welcome back to Shattering This. We're answering uh, uh, Glenn's question. I'm, and I'm quite confident that Glenn didn't ask the question because he doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer but realizes that going over the explanation of uh, of what occurred being very clear and uh, and uh, precise uh, in accordance with Yahweh's instructions would be very helpful for listeners to this program. So uh, the Psalm twenty second Psalm, uh, the eyewitness testimony in uh, regarding uh, Yosha's statement uh, citing the Psalm, "My God, My God, Why have You Deserted Me?" proves conclusively that God had departed the body and the soul of Yosha as he hung on the upright pole. Now, that's for a lot of reasons. One is that God can't die, and the other reason is that that uh, the soul was going to go to the place of separation from God, and you can't be separated from God if God is with you. But it also points out something that I don't think I have shared before as it relates to this particular event. One of the great problems of Christianity is it created a religion around a man. And then it recast that man as Dionysus, as Bacchus, as, as Osiris, for the express purpose of creating a new religion. And what they never came to recognize, because they changed his name, is that Yahusha is Yahweh saving us. That Yahusha is exactly as Yahweh uh, presented him. That he is a diminished corporeal manifestation of Yahweh set apart from Yahweh. The entirety of God never resided upon, in, or surrounding the man. He is a diminished manifestation of Yahweh. A tiny, a tiny, 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 tiny representation of Yahweh. Go ahead, Glenn. Um, yeah, and, uh, well, Christians are, are aware of this, at least theologians. If you're familiar with the question, the kenotic question, are you familiar mm -hmm. with the concept of the kenotic question? Where, you know, that, you know, um, where they acknowledge just that, you know, that there is, uh, you know, and it was a sort of begs the question, you know, of, you know, what can God relinquish and yet remain God? You know, they have this idea of the, the diminished corporeal manifestation, you know, like of what can God be diminished and yet be, remain God? So, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's a foreign idea, too. Yeah, unfortunately, though, for Christians, uh, and you know this, uh, Glenn, uh, that there are two issues with Christianity that preclude most Christians being able to deal with that. Even though Yahusha said it himself, the Father is greater than I. Uh, the reality is that Paul lied twice. 
when uh, he said that the, the, the fullness of the Godhead resided on him bodily. It's uh, a statement. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's physically impossible. It is absurd. Paul was lying when he said so. But Christians prefer Paul's testimony to Yosha's testimony, who said the Father is greater than I. But the foundation of Christianity, its, it's very foundation, when it becomes a religion, is uh, in the uh, Council of Nicaea, an event staged and promoted by uh, General Constantine, a pagan uh, uh, individual. And the, pros the purpose of the Council of Nicaea, its primary purpose, is unknown to many Christians, but the consequence is now known to all of them. The purpose was to render the Arian controversy moot. Arian recognized that Scripture and Yosha's testimony are consistent, that Yosha was begotten, and that he is a diminished manifestation of Yahweh, and therefore the notion of basing a religion on him, even if you know his name, versus on Yahweh, who is the author of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, who is God, is insane. And so to create the new religion of, of Christianity, the purpose of the Nicene Council was to preclude anyone being aware of or embracing uh, Arian's correct realization that Yosha was a diminished manifestation of Yahweh and therefore any focus on him is misplaced. Right. And so Christians can't, can't deal with the fact that they pray to, uh, if they even understood him correctly, it would be like a toenail clipping compared to the individual from whom he came. Right, right, right. Now, before we, uh, we go too uh, far, I have to go, so I want to uh, go, go back to your explanation before the break. Um, okay. Real quick, and um, in terms of what you described transpiring, you know, yes. um, are there a lot of Christians, given that there's inherent ambiguity in the Christian story of what transpired there, uh, a lot of Christians would probably have no problem, you know, concurring with what you said. Yeah, up to this point, and we will we will continue to detail what actually occurred, so that people are aware of it and can celebrate the event appropriately when shattering this continues after the break. <laughs> 